mystery, a fear, maybe even the hope that there's still a part of this earth that remains unknown or magical. Some people believe that somewhere out of sight, just off in the shadows, there are horrible or misunderstood beasts, human-animal hybrids, or prehistoric animals lost in time. Maybe these people are delusional or mistaken, or maybe they're just curious people concerned about conserving ancient or my and mysterious animals. Or maybe these animals are clues to human psychology. This is Fact and Science Fiction. I'm your host, Carly, and this episode is about cryptids. I wanted to do something fun for Halloween and for the one year anniversary of this podcast. Fact and Sci-Fi debuted October 12th, 2017. And so we may be doing something a little off topic compared to my other episodes. I did a Facebook and Twitter poll about favorite cryptids and some of yours were ones I hadn't even heard of before. On Twitter, Jenna told me about Trunko, which is an unidentified biological mass, aka Globster, which is my new favorite word, that washed up on the shore of South Africa in the early 1920s. If I don't mention your favorite cryptid, um, you can tweet me at Fact and Sci-Fi. Now let's go on with the show. Cryptids may be a new word for you, but you've probably heard of at least one of them in the category. Bigfoot or Sasquatch, Chupacabra or the Jersey Devil, the Loch Ness Monster or Champ in Link Champlain. These animals are cryptids because their existence hasn't been accepted by the scientific community. Cryptozoology is the study of these animals. Literally, the prefix crypt means hidden, and cryptozoology means the study of these hidden animals. Cryptids have been around for centuries, and in his article called Cryptozoology in the Medieval and Modern Worlds, Dr. Peter Dendel argues that people have been fascinated by cryptids since humans have created cultures and stories, even if they weren't necessarily called cryptids at that time. According to Bernard Hovelmans, known as the father of folklore, for an animal to count as a cryptid, it must have at least one trait truly singular, unexpected, paradoxical, striking, emotionally upsetting, and thus capable of mythification. I really liked learning about all these different animals, so I want to review a few examples of my favorites. So I've mentioned before that I have a very deep fear of aquatic dinosaurs. And I don't really know why, because when I was younger, one of my favorite movies was about a sea serpent. In the 90s and early 2000s, several movies were made about some magical or ancient beast in the depths of lakes or locks. My sister and my favorite was Magic in the Water from 1995. This film and others like Water Horse were aimed at children, so the protagonists were children who wanted to protect these animals. In Magic in the Water, the sea serpent had magical powers and could almost possess people. But in real life, the witness stories of Loch Ness and Lake Champlain and others describe a solitary creature. Not really magical at all, but just like any fish or amphibian or reptile living under the surface. Another subset of cryptids are the ape men, tall hairy creatures that walk on two legs. Some describe maybe a large ape, kind of hunched over, while others describe a bipedal man. Notably, there is Bigfoot or Sasquatch, which has been tied to North America, reportedly in woodland areas. But there are others, like the Yeti or Abominable Snowman, which has been tied to colder, wintry climates, and the Mirgu, a similar creature to the Yeti, but reportedly living in Bhutan. Then there's the Boggy Creek Monster in Falk, Arkansas, which is described as having red or yellow eyes. Cryptozoologists speculate that these creatures could be either giant apes that escaped extinction or a missing link between apes and humans. Similarly, there are cryptids described as all kinds of hybrids, such as the Jersey Devil, which has the head of the goat, the body and hooves of a horse, and wings like a large bat, or Mothman, another large winged creature with glowing red eyes. It's been described as having the wings of a bird and the wings of an insect. In 2017, in Chicago, there were 55 sightings of a large, mothman-looking creature flying haphazardly like a bat, and those sightings are still unexplained. But stories of the mothman were more prevalent in the West Virginia area in the 1970s. Folklorist Jan Harold Brunvand 
found elements in common among many Mothman reports and much older folk tales, suggesting that something real may have triggered the scares and became woven with existing folklore, and the current myth of Mothman was born. The sightings of Mothman in the 1970s led to a lot of paranoia about aliens, UFOs, and government conspiracies, which led to a panic. When a local bridge collapsed, that tragedy and the Mothman became inexplicably linked. Folks then reported they had premonitions of the bridge collapsing due to Mothman, or they were visited by aliens and clandestine men in black suits. Another creature that is portrayed in films and television is the Wendigo which has been described as having the shape of a man. The stories of Wendigos come from Native American myths of men succumbing to greed or hunger and turning on other people, and then being turned into monsters. As described in the podcast lore, a Native American man was so hungry that he cannibalized his own tribe members and became a horrible monster that could never be satisfied again, no matter how much he ate. In some cases, cryptids can be cautionary tales like this one. Stories of human-monster hybrids have existed in many cultures across time. Peter Dendel argues that these stories serve a very important purpose for communities. They raise questions about the essence of humanity by contrasting it with animality or even deformity. In fact, folklorists hypothesize that the reason these animals are hidden in swamps, lakes, or underground caverns in stories is because they are so horrible. They serve as symbols of abominations to God. Whether these stories come from folk tales, myths, or from first-person accounts, there are some examples of real animals that were thought of as cryptids at one time. The first example I want to talk about is the platypus. When the first specimen of a platypus was sent back to Europe from Australia or New Zealand, I'm not sure which, people thought it was a hoax. They thought the bill was literally sewed on. And at that point, they didn't even realize how strange the platypus is as an animal. Now we know it's an animal that holds a lot of characteristics from its ancient ancestors. It's a mammal that lays eggs like a turtle. It has electroreception, meaning it sends out electrical signals from its brain like an eel. This animal and its relative, the the echidna, are so strange, and they're real. The giant squid was also thought to be a mythical beast from beneath the depths, described as the kraken or other tentacled beast that sunk ships. Now we know that the giant squids and other giant fish or cephalopods are in the deep ocean, where the pressure of the sea basically holds them together, so that when they raise from the sea, they look even more terrifying. Another example is the okapi, which explorers and colonizers heard about from Africans in the 1700s and 1800s, but they could never see with their own eyes. The okapi are a mammal that looks like a zebra, but with the face of a giraffe. They are so shy and so quiet in the wild that it took a long time to actually see one. It wasn't until the early 1900s that a specimen was confirmed, and now they have to be exclusively bred in captivity in order to study them because they're still so hard to observe in the wild. So where do these stories come from? How do we parse between the mythical and what we know about animals? Well, we can look at history first. I wanted to specifically bring up explorers and colonizers because a lot of cryptozoology and descriptions of these creatures can be connected to that time. So two things happened. First, Europeans received translations of ancient Greek and Roman texts for the first time. So explorers were reading descriptions of minotaurs and women with snakes as hair. They read descriptions of goat-man hybrids and gods that could change their shape. The second thing that happened is that Europeans were traveling to the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, and Africa for the first time. These places had people living there, of course, but were thought of as untouched by civilization. You can't see, but I have air quotes around civilization. These explorers would travel to these faraway lands for riches, for their reputation, or for the burgeoning field of science and observation. One infamous example is Sir Walter Raleigh. He explored what is now Venezuela and Guyana, observing and writing down what he saw and what he heard from Venezuelans and the Guyanese. He specifically was looking for the legendary city of gold, and the native folks, probably as a prank, told him it was always just around the river bend. He never found it, obviously, but he couldn't go back to Queen Elizabeth I empty-handed, so what he did was bring back his journals, and working with an illustrator named Depry, 
He published a book called The Discovery of the Large, Rich, and Beautiful Empire of Guyana. In their history book, Going to the Source, Victoria Bissell Brown and Timothy J. Shannon wrote that this book by Sir Walter Raleigh depicted scenes of golden-laden Indians and illustrations of animals and fantastical creatures that inhabited the New World that Europe had never seen before, like monkeys, parrots, man-eating alligators, and manatees. Whether trying to secure more funding for his search for the City of Gold or because he truly believed the tales he had heard, Raleigh described Native Americans covered in gold and mythical warriors called the Iwai Panomo, which were tall men with eyes in their shoulders and mouths in their chests. Even though he described far-fetched creatures and beings in some ways, he also had some very detailed and accurate descriptions of the wildlife in others. Unfortunately, Debray, the illustrator, took some creative license with some of these animal illustrations. There are animals in this book that Sir Walter Raleigh never described in the writings. Bissell Brown and Shannon say that Debray and other illustrators in that time could have been inspired by paintings and artwork from biblical representations of animals on stained glass or just from their imagination. But these artworks horrified and entertained audiences for decades, and people described animals in similar ways for a long, long time, even if it was proven that they came from the artist's imaginations. Okay, now let's go back to the ancient Greek and Roman texts that were translated for the first time. Bissell Brown and Shannon say this definitely influenced the way explorers and observers described what they saw in the New World. They wrote that many European explorers, when confronted with the strange anatomies and habits of American animals, described them as amalgams of different Old World animals that resemble these mythological beasts. One early description of an animal was of a strange monster the foremost part resembling a fox, the hinder a monkey, the feet were like a man's, with ears like an owl, under whose belly hung a great bag in which it carried the young. Have you guessed the animal? It was an opossum. I posted an image from this book by Bissell Brown and Shannon of animal illustrations, and they all look very similar because they're all inspired by the same things. Manatees look like whales, look like alligators. These illustrations continued to influence how people thought of the Americas for nearly two centuries. So when cryptids today are described as half-wolf, half-human, or as a creature with the head of a goat and the body of a horse, maybe it's because that's how we've always explored things, using language we know to describe what we see. And with time, we have a name for those creatures, like the platypus. But we're influenced by the things we've seen and the stories we've heard. When you see a large figure in the woods that can't be immediately identified, how do you describe it? Finding these hidden animals today has the same spirit of the early explorations in multiple ways. Scientific discovery today may be less interesting to cryptozoologists. Peter Dendel wrote, It's not the vast myriad of undiscovered mites or new varieties of plankton that cryptozoologists are really interested in. Like defined early in the episode, cryptids, the hidden animals that garner the most attention are the large, horrific beasts of folklore. The struggle believers and witnesses have is the burden of proof. How do you prove a creature is real? It's so easy to deny a thing exists, to wave away any evidence, of footprints of eyewitness testimony. Typically, the way we prove things are real, whether it's the existence of an animal or even the effectiveness of a treatment, is through scientific consensus. A group of scientists have to agree. But this is nothing new. Dr. Peter Dendel wrote that there were skeptics even back in the second and fifth centuries, who would be their voice of reason when travelers would come back to Europe telling stories of centaurs and werewolves. Even before there were scientific communities, writers argued amongst themselves about the existence of hidden beasts. Maybe some of these cryptids started out as pranks that the native folks told explorers, like the City of Gold or the Iwaipanoma. Maybe their shared paranoia, like I expect the Mothman became after an entire town was scared witless. Maybe we'll discover species that are similar to the descriptions of cryptids, like the giant squid. The squid and Okapi are examples of scientific consensus finally siding with the believers. Maybe in some instances, the difference between myth and reality is time. Peter Dendel wrote that we may always project our primordial fears onto hidden monsters. Our fears of the dark, the unknown, the primitive, the reptilian. Perhaps we're afraid of something inside of us that we can't control. 
anger, lust, greed, hunger, that when we can name it, describe it, crystallize it into a concrete symbol, it makes us feel better. But maybe it isn't so subconscious or deep. Maybe we just like a good mystery. Research from this episode came from Going to the Source, Volume 1 to 1877, by Victoria Bissell Brown and Timothy J. Shannon. Cryptozoology in the Medieval and Modern Worlds by Peter Dendel. The Okapi Conservation Project and Legendary Cryptids that Turned Out to Be Real on io9.com. If you like this episode, please send me a message on Twitter or Facebook at Fact and Sci Fi, or leave a review and I'll give you a shout out on the show. This episode, I want to thank Jace B for reaching out on Facebook and David Bernstein author of Blockbuster Science. Thanks for listening. One last thing. In honor of my first year of podcasting, I'd like to help you create your own podcast. If you submit your email in the blog, factandsciencefiction.com, on the About the Host page, I'll send you an email of all the YouTube tutorials that I've found incredibly helpful. These videos break down how to write, record, and edit your podcast using free tools. I've had a couple friends ask me for tips, and I want to extend that to you. Check out the transcript for this episode and other content on the blog at factandsciencefiction.com. And lastly, thanks for listening.